the Sudanese have a great political art, which is um, historically called tajility, from tajil, the Arabic for delay, which means the ability to defer and procrastinate. And a number of key issues were, uh, were left unresolved from 2005 at the time of the referendum, at the time of independence, and they're all coming back now. There's the issue of the border. The two sides had six years in which there was an ad hoc border committee meeting to try and work out where the border lay. And they produced all the documentation. They, they agreed on 80% of the border. They didn't get to mark it out on the ground. They didn't actually put the markers in on the ground, but they agreed 80% on the map. And they agreed five disputed areas that um, should be go to either some form of negotiation or, to, if necessary, to arbitration. And on the issue of oil, again, the, all the issues were laid out on the table. They explored the, 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 uh, the options and they agreed a number of principles. And one was that they would, uh, they would work towards two viable states, two economically viable states which were interdependent, which is necessary because the oil is in the south, but the only current way of pumping it to market is through the north. Um, now, a number of proposals were batted backwards and forwards, were put on the table by the African Union panel, etc. Um, there was one that was actually accepted by the South at the end of last year, rejected by the North. And then in January this year, there was one that was um, in, in principle accepted by the North, then in principle accepted by the South, then the South changed its mind. And at that time, um, because of the economic pressure of the North was facing and the fact that it said, in principle, we've agreed that there should be some sort of payment. The North started taking payment unilaterally in kind against any agreement, any, any, any principle, just seizing some oil. And in response to that, the South said, well, we're going to cut off our oil entirely. But the oil production and the revenue from it accounted for 98% of the South's budget and 80 odd percent of its GDP. So to cut that off was, was a very bold step and only made sense if an agreement could be reached or the situation could be dramatically changed in the four or five months that they had left while their reserves lasted because um, without that oil revenue they have next to nothing. They can't run the state, they can't run the army, they can't finance day-to-day -day operations. So that created a real deadline and, and one of the things you see today is because of the imminence of that financial deadline, the date when the South's money runs out, the South is getting much more assertive and the North is itself getting more assertive because it, there are many hardliners in the North who, who, who believe that if they wait until the South runs out of money and the South begins to collapse, then they'll be in a much stronger position. When the country separated, there were probably 750,000 people of Southern origin within Northern Sudan and a smaller number of Northerners in the South. And in, two principles were agreed um, in, in principle at the time of separation. One was that there would be a nine-month transitional period um, up to the 9th of April of, of this year in which these people could regularize their status. And secondly, that they would have uh, what was called the four freedoms, the rights of residence, of work, um, uh, of, of movement, and of owning property. But the actual practical steps to implement that were never undertaken. The two sides just didn't trust each other enough to, to really go ahead and, and, and make those a reality. So as of today, we have about 700,000 southerners in the north who are de facto stateless. There is no really workable mechanism for giving them ID cards, for giving them their rights. So these people are desperately vulnerable. I think the fundamental issue, the, the issue that has, has really sparked the crisis and, and, and has begun to unravel other things, is the fact that the, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement was for the whole of Sudan, but at the same time the majority of its uh, membership were for southern independence. And in voting for southern independence, it had a very considerable minority within northern Sudan, north of, the, of what was then the internal um, border. And the issues for this minority within South Sudan, the political issues and the security issues, were not properly addressed in the 2005 agreement. Instead of getting the right of self-determination, they got a rather vague right to a popular consultation on their future. 
and they were not strong enough, politically powerful enough to be a, a constituency that really determined the political future of Northern Sudan. But perhaps most importantly, the security arrangements for these communities in two areas, Southern Kordofan, or also known as Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile, were not properly worked out. So the agreement, the 2005 agreement, provided for the, the local guerrilla fighters from those areas who had been members of the SPLA to go to the south um, in the event of separation. So these people were supposed to abandon their communities and go to what was becoming a foreign country, leaving their communities undefended, leaving the issues on which they, for which they had fought for all those years um, completely at the mercy of, of, of their former enemies. And as the referendum occurred and as the date of separation approached, this issue began to bubble up. So now what you see is the, the fighters, or the rebel fighters in the north, are fighting with the flag of South Sudan on their shoulders. So they are still, they're still an, an, an unresolved issue there. 